upset. <clears throat> Should I mute and just uh, uh, and mute when we talk because otherwise there will, will be a uh, uh, the sound will will be um, confusing okay so please Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, it's really lovely to see you all. Um, and uh, Indran and I have been co-hosting this for a couple of years now. This is our, uh, what, season two or three? I'm forgetting now. Uh, um, and um, we have one poet is, not, is missing because she can't be here, but we have three absolutely outstanding poets. and. In fact, we'll have, they'll have more time to read in this episode because one person is not there. And we'll uh, start with Sarah and then Vidyan will be reading and then Helen. So Sarah will be introduced by Indran and Vidyan and uh, Helen will be introduced by me. So over to you, Indran. Thank you, welcome everyone. Delighted uh, to welcome you back to Poets and Writers Studio International. Um, Sarah Avio is a discovery for me. She's one of my, become fast, become one of my most favored poets. And, and her music is, is just uh, breathtaking, you know. And, and you know, it one brings up that old question of, you know, if, if the music is there, it almost seems irrelevant, the, the matter, the words. You know. She has an amazing uh, ear and, uh, and sound, and you'll hear that in the, in the poem she'll read today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, just based on a, a sort of a rough bio. Her new book is Cry Back My Sea, Cry Back My Sea, uh, Lord, it is an ode to love. Her previous book, Night Thoughts, 70 Dream Poems and Notes from an Analysis, a hybrid of poems, essay and memoir. She is uh, a celebrated translator. Uh -huh. Her version of Federico Garcia Lorca's Poet in Spain, New Translations, garnered wide acclaim. She attended the School of Arts in New York. She has won the Rome Prize of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, fellowships from the Guggenheim and Bogliasso Foundations, and the National Endowment for the Arts, among other honors. She worked for many years as a translator for the United Nations in New York and Geneva. She's also taught at Princeton and at the School of the Arts. A long time New Yorker, she has resided in Paris, Rome, Madrid, Mexico City, Caracas, and uh, even by in Maryland by the Chesapeake Bay. All her books are available um, at the well-known publisher, Alfred Knopf, and uh, excited to have you with us, Sarah. Go ahead. Please uh, unmute, uh, Sarah, if you can. Am I here? Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. I'm going to read off another screen, which I haven't tried before. We'll see if this works. I'll just show you a book, which I was already trying to show you, while Indran is saying his introduction. Do you see it? Cry back my sea. They made quite, a, quite an extravagant cover. I like it a lot. I'm starting someplace in the middle of the book, which is a bit in the middle of the story. Um, Cry back my sea is a sequence. All of my um, books have turned out to be sequences because one poem follows the other. 
and then the next one follows and the next one follows and there's a natural sequence to it. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Wreck. When life is a wreck with reams of remorse and thousands of replies, can all the roses and wintergreen and heart, oh, reckless heart, heart rack, is it realizable to start again with our faces wearing their young green hope? A white rose on the bedstand, white curtains ruffling, and the riffling trees. I turn to you and say this, ruffle me. What is this ruffle, an inner stir, stirring through my life as if it were my life? It may be something else for no one knows where any stir comes from, where any riff, where any love comes from or how it comes. Wrecked heart, racked heart, all the roses and winter green and heart. Crow, my only hate, my only love, you like to chant, chant can't, chant can't. Oh, my clarion of a summer day, carrion squawk of your old heart. I never cared you carry on under the blue sky of a summer day, a hell of a day, a sigh for a day, halcyon cyanide day, lying in a field on a summer day, calamitous calm gaze, your can't do and nothing else can do. While I cavil, I do, I do. You collapse in my lap. Oh, my lapsed love, you old cuckoo, you. Rook me of my heart, oh, crooked heart. Oh, crackpot heart. Oh, my clochard, my wanton clock. I do not want your do not care. I excoriate your do not care. I core out your heart, curse you, old crow. I know that you care. You with me? Yes. Rambo, this is Rambo, the poet. <laughs> Rambo or desert love. I learned from a biography, uh, a, a wonderful biography of um, Rambo by, um, I believe it's Graham Robb, is that right? Um, who, that Rambo walked and walked and walked in Africa and that in his old age, his eyes were, had gone white. Rambo or desert love. You must walk your thousand miles. Rambo walked till his eyes turned white. His mother was a wretch. Therefore he walked his thousand miles. Boys with wretch mothers. Need your desert eyes, white searing desert eyes served but not deserved through the white desert for many days in a white sandstorm, watching the sand bodies roll and turn in the white desertifying desert wind. Desertification occurs after the dereliction, after the derision. Dear love, your derelict desire, corpus delicti, you must walk your white miles carrying the body of your fence. Mm. Lovely, marvelous. Thank you. This one is called Kissing Her or Morning Glory. And you're, you'll see that there's a pun on the name of Kissinger, the great 
master architect of the Vietnam War. Kissing her or a morning glory, you're angry as a dog or an angora cat, an anguilla with, with gills, an anguilla with gills. All eels do have gills. You're angry as an eel. You do not feel your heart. You only pump your gills. I'm surprised that eels bark, sometimes mew like cats, right before the hiss. And hiss rhymes with kiss, short for Kissinger, who was instrumental in the making of a war, the history and hisses of a gala glorious war. While you were kissing me, the day was such a glory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing at my own jokes. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love the D, yes. yes. The what? I'm sorry, Indrin. What did you say? Uh, no, no, no. It's okay. I have a question later, but I will come to it later. Oh, yeah. it's you, said. Excuse me. Should we, should we Excuse me. I'm going to um, rudely get myself a glass of water. Can you stand that? Just a second. This is the lovely part of having it as a home salon where you can wander off and get wine and beer and water. <laughs> I think it's wonderful when people like their own stuff. It's the greatest, <laughs> it's the greatest. <laughs> <clears throat> you have to like it. You have to love it. <laughs> I I usually hate my poems first and then I grow to like them. And later on I really like them a lot. And then in the beginning I think they're really kind of stupid. <laughs> this one is called Trinkets. I didn't notice until quite a while after I wrote this down that um, there is a pun on, tr on trinkets and drink it, which comes in at the end of the poem. Trinkets. First you gave me the jewels and then you gave me the scars. Why did you want to twist my wrist right where the bracelet turns? Why did you want to wring my finger where the ring might have fit? All I have now are the jewels and scars on the scarp of my life. I'm up or down, though I don't know which. I know that I'm injured and scared. I've got them now in a burnished heap, gaudy, old, glamorous trinkets with stones and gems from inside the rock and an old glug of memory to drink. And will there be more glamour? And will there be more drink in my brace of garments as I scuff up and downtown, carping and glowing? There is not much to give or say. I'll have some glug and get some sleep and some life love as deep as a drink. Not my life's love, but love for my life. I will drink it even if you can't. Mm. Oh, marvelous, Sarah. Marvelous. That glug, that play. Very good. Glug. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. This one is bone. I never read it aloud before. Even to my, well, to myself, I suppose. Let's give it a try. Body. Part bone and part bomb. Yours is all sore and ready. Not a tin can or a cocktail. Yours is atomic, a bomb made of your atoms. I have a diamond. You have an atomizer, 
of the anatomical and soul being, concording your soul atoms into a soul bomb for atomizing my soul with its adamant gleam. I'm towing around and avoiding the pulse so as not to jig the trigger or tip the jigger. This is a soul bomb solely for me, arraigning my brilliance. Why do bombers bomb a beauty body? Mm. Adamant, adamant gleam, wonderful. I somehow have chosen all the angry ones. <laughs> um, I didn't mean to be this target of someone else's anger. It wasn't a purpose in my life. This poem is called Tu Mi Vinci. And right there, there's a pun on, because I'm going to talk about Da Vinci and his famous triangle, which is a triangle with a circle in the middle of it and a body hanging there in the circle. Tu Mi Vinci means you conquer me also happens to me in Italian. Tu me vinci or hang. You hang me on the hanger of your anger. Like da Vinci's triangle and Vinci is vanquish and vanquish is like anguish and hang is what we do to criminals and clothes. Is it a crime to hang around your neck, staring in your eyes and kissing your lips. Here I am hanging naked and splayed. I'm hung up on you. You're hanging me up. There's no other angle. I've flung them all out. You've taken myself and you've hung it in the triangle of you where I'm dangling. I'll go away in a new set of clothes for a cocktail or a crime, does it matter? But please let me down off your hanger. Oh, love, let me be free of your anger. I'll hang around sign. Now I am mine. Old words you can't get the hang of. Hmm. Red dress, red dress miraculously came out of the New York Review of Books. And it went, goes very well with the poem because it talks about appearing in papers. So it was, it's a newspaper, so it kind of worked out. A newspaper and, uh, well, we know what it is, red dress. <clears throat> It's wrong to live wrong. I was thinking this and wringing my hands. I wrung my hands. Wasn't it right to live right and to write about the right life rather than living wrong and writing about the wrong life? Which is righter? Which is wronger? The thing is, if you have the wrong life, you don't want to tell, thinking always that somehow you will write it. Writing and writing, it's a kind of redress, a new dress I'll put on when I rewrite my life. I'll run out and get it now while there's still time. A red dress for joy, a red dress for redress. And I'll dress you down as I walk out the door. You'll ring and ring, but I won't rush back. I won't write back. You'll be right and I'll be wronged. And that's what I'll tell if I get the time, but not to you. You won't be told. You can read my redress in papers. I'll be out on the town in my red dress. Mm. <laughs> the revenge of the red dress. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or the redressing of that. 
So I have a few more. I can, may I go on? Yes. yes, of course. We have plenty of time. Good. This one is um, sheepfold. It has a play on the word tropics. And in, at one point there's a trope and there is de trop, de trop, which is too much, too much. Is that a good translation of de trop? T-R-O-P, <clears throat> just like tropics. Sheepfold. It's so cold here and there's the snow. He doesn't like snow. He's from the tropics. There's ice to be precise. There are icicles. He wants it hot. He wants the tropics. He keeps saying it over and over. She's thinking that this is a trope or de trop, de trop. She does know she doesn't know. He does know. He doesn't know. Say this all fast and it will be as snow. All white, as white and cold and as ephemeral. All of their truths will be as snow. The trees are black in the winter woods. And now they are passing the sheepfold. White sheep and black sheep mingle together. They are a tropism all turning one way. And a fold is a word that she desires. Fold and wool are things that she desires. But there is much cry and little wool. The sheep are running as a herd, their little hooves pounding the white snow. She needs to be careful, she thinks, or she'll die of exposure out here in the cold. The ram is out ahead. There's only one of him. But here they are now, the two of them. You snowed me, she said, which meant he had lied. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you know the um, old English proverb, much cry and little wool? Mm. It's an old English proverb, much cry and little wool. That popped in there. Rodeo of the Rose. This is a play on the word ride and the word deride, very different from each other, meaning. Rodeo of the Rose. It's like I fell off the horse of my life. I was horsing around and he bucked me. I went over sideways or backwards, or I don't even know how I went, but I went. It's like you don't know your own horse. It's like you're riding along and he rides you. He keeps at it and at it till you buckle and break a rib or a toe or heartbeat. Never mind that I wanted to be soothed and suckled. Never mind that I wanted to ride and ride, replete with life joy. Ah, ah, I, I, all the sighs and gaspy breaths when you're riding full out on the joy path. But there are folks who can't bear the joy, the rippling, rip it, the rippling, riveting, enchanting joy. They've got to buck you till they flip you, they deride you, and they deride themselves. Whose horse was this anyway? Wasn't it mine? Or was there someone else somewhere leading them in and handing them out, glad handing the folks at the rodeo, a grand master of disaster and desire, carrying a whip and a full-blown rose? Mm. 
This is the grimmest. <laughs> this is the grimmest of all these grim poems. Hope they're grim and amusing at the same time. Um, bed. I haven't got a fingernail or bed or even the bed of a fingernail. And I was hoping that you were the nail that would hang me up on the joy wall. And I was hoping you were the finger that would point me toward the rainbow as the rain bowed and slashed and all the colors stood still in the singing wind. I haven't got a mailbox or a box for my files or my fingernail filings. I haven't got a box of photographs or a graph of the days of rage and pain or only on my heart which hurts me. I haven't got a file to cut off the chain or a ring. I wanted a ring and a song, a bed with a head, a heart and a soul. Though there are so many places to sleep, I have to say you hit the nail on the head and that was my nail and my head. And now I'm dead. There are so many places to sleep. I have fallen from the joy wall and died. <laughs> Relentless there. Mm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there are no prisoners. <laughs> Spare no reader. Yeah. Sorry, the next poem uh, on the chat box is not the way it should be on the page, but that's the limitation of the column with uh, that's our that's, that's our last one go ahead sir go and go speaking of mm. go ahead he says go and go <laughs> we don't want you to go but this is the last one i guess so go and go one person in the universe can be the universe one turn or one verse, like turning over in bed or turning in a dance, the unique and united one niche of your life, the one single hub of your universe, the unicycle that wants another wheel or the cyclonic disruption of all the lines, the body flying off the cycle and rolling on the road. Oh, pour me some please a big unison drink, a big gulp for two of us staring in one glass. As the cycle turns and each turn says, life, love, life, love, life, love, a niche or a nest in one old bed or old tree, all the arms going up and stretching in sleep and all going round like branches in a wind all go up in the end, all go down. They go down in the end. They go and go in the end. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Marvelous, Thank you. Sarah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Much. Brava, brava. Thank yes. you so much. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, sometimes when you have uh, just the music, you don't really the commentary afterwards sort of, it's sort of a, a little bit of a letdown, but I, I do have to just say, go back to the introduction where I commented about your sound and your sound effects and your your skills with with meter and rhyme and 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 all the all the devices that you've internalized. I don't know if you were born singing, but you you probably were, um, as opposed to crying. So you cry, of course, in your poems and as well and. And, and you 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 talk about experience uh, as well as innocence and, and the nail on the wall and the nail in the bed and so on. Uh, tell us about sound making. I mean, you'll come up with a line when you write a poem, 
and then does the line then generate, beget the next line, and, and does the poem go somewhere based on that instinct, instinctive sort of sense you have of what the first line is telling you, or, or do you have a plan where you want to write a poem about the subject, this particular subject, and, and then you look for the, for the right words to, to tell you? To meet your plan, I'm just if you could just tell all our audience and, you know, about about your, um, I guess how you write and, and how you make the music uh, go from line one to to the end. Go ahead. You know, I I did um, a dream analysis. I mean, I did psychoanalysis for a number of years. Mm -hmm. I was very blocked, and so I, um, I said, and I also wrote down, I got up in the morning and wrote down my dream, and I wrote every thought that came to my mind, and I found that my thoughts fell into patterns, sometimes like a sequence of colors, or sometimes like a sequence of sound, and um, when I actually started writing, um, after quite a long pause, I was writing slick like splurging the same way that my brain was splurging the dream information. So um, I, I confess that I write these poems faster than I can think. And um, I don't pause. And right in the middle, I always say, this is really stupid, stop. And then I remind myself not to stop. And I keep on going through till I'm done. And then they usually take about 12 to 15 minutes in all. And then, um, I usually have a period of rejecting the poem and then finding, then liking it again. But uh, uh, there's that there's that really important moment when I tell myself not to censor myself. Mm. 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 So it's so it's. Mm. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it's a rich answer, rich mm. rich in the sense of dope. So. Yeah. thought you know Hel go ahead go ahead sit. helen helen just wrote in the chat box that uh, you, you do grim and playfulness together very very well it's a really hard task it's a really hard task to do that but i also have a you know query about sonics in your poem which indran touched on uh, when you sent me the poems i of course first read it on the page without reading it out aloud to me and then I read it several times and I have this old analog habit of actually taking a pencil and marking things and making the page really untidy. Um, and they are my secret uh, notes to the poet. Uh, if I meet them, it's fine. If I don't, but they are my codes. And what was interesting was I did three readings, three uh, readings to myself aloud and um, my, the places I was stopping in terms of, your know, lines are often not end stopped. It's very Hopkins-esque where, you know, in the middle of the line is where you pause longer than say the end of the line and it sort of wraps around. So the, the interweaving of the lines is very, very uh, sophisticated though visually it's very clean and tidy, but I know there's a lot of work that has gone beyond that. So sonically, when you read the poem, and I'm not surprised, you were stopping at different places. So there's this wonderful orchestra of music that happens. How much of uh, sound calibration do you actually do? Uh, because they're just incredibly rich uh, on that level. Of course, I'm just really anal when it comes to prosody, but that's also the beauty of your poems. You know, there's so much there. The great Richard Howard was my mentor uh, and um, who he just died. And um, let us pause for one moment and remember this wonderful self and greatness. Um, he, <laughs> he, he told me not to write free verse. He wanted me to write in syllabics and I couldn't get that to work for me. He said, try nine and 11 syllables. So I um, tried that and that did not work. It was wrong. 
so I just said, well, let me just try the 10, but I'll um, avoid those on that metronome, that famous metronome. I'll just write the 10. So I um, started writing 10 syllable lines and um, worked on it. And it became so natural that all of my um, books I've written in 10 syllable lines, which I would like to break away from, um, because it's become a tick of some kind. But I hear the music of, I hear the, speaking of music, I hear the music of that line. I never count syllables. I simply hear it, how the, the length of the line. And in this book, there are disguised 10 syllable lines because I broke the lines in different places so that you can't see that there are 10, but the sound, the line is still running through as 10s. And that's what gives it the, it's a sense of orderliness to the sound. Fascinating. I mean, you know, you, you write such, I mean, you're a master of long sequences in any case. Uh, and, and there's just such wonderful sense of interiority, uh, which is really attractive. I mean, the silences are so loud when you probe into the poems, it's just marvelous. It's just been such a treat to hear you, actually. This is the yeah. first time it's the first time I'm hearing you. I've only read you on the page, um, but this has been a real Thank treat. you, Sudi. Thank you so much. So happy to be here with you. Yes. Wonderful. Thank Sarah. you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just have one little tiny question more about Henry Kissinger and kissing her. And I, I too <laughs> have writ, written about Henry Kissinger. It was a punk rock song in my day when I was writing about him going storming through the world, causing all kinds of pain and ruin. And, and you have a line in the poem about the gala and glorious war. I just wanted you to ask about that, whether I, I take that line as an ironic line about, Please. about <laughs> but, but, but beyond that, um, I wonder if Henry Kissinger has, ever, has seen your poem or heard it, but aside from that, uh, is he still with us? He's still with, <laughs> us, still with us and still advising some people. But um, anyway, fascinating combination of sort of brute, hard political reality. And, and this, um, so I congratulate you on that and, and all of your poems. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'm curious, though, whether you think about um, contemporary politics and history and so on. Uh, uh, or did Kissinger show up because of just the, the wordplay that sort of occurred to you in writing the poem? I mean, in other words, did Kissinger well, I, inspire I, the poem or did you put Kissinger into the poem from Kisser? He, he just popped into the poem. Okay. So, but he popped in the poem because he, because I'm a, uh, I was a 60s kid. And um, I was on the uh, picket line. I went to the great demonstrations in New York and Washington, all of those as a kid. I'm just talking about 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. And we were all very well aware of Mr. Kissinger, Kissinger and his importance to the war. So um, that was my, that's my seminal war. There are other wars now that we have to be um, right. Right. feeling very upset about. I, I was so, I was so upset by it that I wouldn't watch the TV news. Everyone else gathered in the living room to watch the news and I ran so that I wouldn't have to see um, the, the color images of what was happening in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Sarah. This was a marvelous, marvelous reading. I'm really rich. Thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> what a fantastic start. So next we have another brilliant poet who, again, I'm really seeing for the first time on stage, we've never met, but often the best poetry and the best uh, poets don't meet for a long time, which is probably a good thing. And you meet on the page first. And uh, I've been following his work for a long, long time. And, his, uh, and, and remarkably, he's also just such a fine, a uh, writer of criticism and prose as well. I've put the bio on the side, but I always formally read it out because it is important to articulate um, 
the persona as well. The child of Sri Lankan Tamils, Vidya and Ravindran grew up in a mixed area of Leeds in the north of England and now teaches at Harvard. He's the author of two books of verse, The Million Petal Flower of Being Here. What a beautiful title. It came out in 2019, won the Northern Writers Award, was a PBS recommendation uh, for American audience. That's the Poetry Book Society in England and was shortlisted for the Forward and the T.S. Eliot Prizes. His study on Elizabeth Bishop won both the University English Prize and the Warren Brooks Award for Outstanding Literary Criticism. With Sash Trevitt, who's been featured on our program before, and Seni Senevit Ratne, he, they're co-editing an anthology of Sri Lankan poetry, which should be coming out from Blood Axe. He helps organize Ledbury Critics, a UK-US scheme for increasing racial diversity in review culture. Three more books are forthcoming, an academic study of spontaneity and form in modern prose, Oxford University Press, Worlds Woven Together, Essays on Poetry and Poetics, Columbia University Press, and a fusion of memoir with literary criticism. Love to, waiting for that. Asian slash other, a life in poetry, which is coming out from Icon and Norton. With then a real treat to have you. A very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sudeep, so much. Thank you, Indra. And also, Thank you, Sarah, for such a lovely reading. You know, it's <clears throat> you know, you read poems on the page that are obviously so melodic, but then to actually, you know, finally get to hear those poems spoken by the poet, that's really nice. Um, okay, so I thought, I mean, I've got only five poems here, and and four of them are sonnets, and they're from the last book, which was a book of sonnets uh, for my wife. Um, and in the middle of those four sonnets, I'm going to read one other poem by another poet. It's uh, the deceased Sri Lankan poet, Alfreda de Silva, who's just one of several really good poets whom Shash and Saini and I have discovered while trying to edit this anthology. And, you know, just people who are out of print and really need to be back in print. Um, so um, I guess I, I like to read some poems by those people, uh, partly, you know, so you know about them and partly in case the editor of some press is at one of these readings and says, yes, let's get this person back in print or something. <laughs> so if that does interest you, um, please get in touch. Okay, but I'll, I'll begin with um, one of my own sonnets called Ceylon. Ceylon, the words on the tip of your tongue, or as you say it, tongue, as we take tea. Waiting for you to speak, I sip mine. Tetley's tastes of nothing, but I suppose it's good to know true flavorlessness, the prose of life we sugar over with verse. Ceylon, you say, a trochee, not an iron, Re referring to the drink I drink with two spoonfuls at home, and here, none. Though by home, I mean the house my parents live in and where I grew up, like and unlike them saying back at home when they intend Sri Lanka and not Leeds, where they live and I haven't, not for years. Mm. Um, so obviously, you know, uh, you know, a lot of tea is grown in Sri Lanka as in India, and there are partly colonial colonial reasons for that. There's a long history behind that. Obviously, also um, English people, um, and I was born in England, really like drinking tea. Uh, I'm just trying to think of anything else I should explain about this poem to, to, to people in other countries. English people drink a lot of really bad tea. Um, that's one way of putting it. So we went to... Um, tea plantation in New Aurelia in the upcountry in Sri Lanka. It's really beautiful. And they'll take you on a tour and they'll tell you about the best kinds of tea. And you know, the best kind is a broken orange pico. And then there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of hierarchy coming down. And the lowest category is just called dust. <laughs> so you're asking them, what kind of tea makes it into tea bags in England? And, and this guy said, 
dust. <laughs> so, so, so the English brand Tetley's, you know, I guess that's what we drink is we drink tea that doesn't really taste of anything. And, um, and uh, there was a bit of chat between Sarah and Sudeep, I think, about um, prosody and being a prosody nerd. Was it Sudeep who said that actually? Um, and I am one too. So this poem mentions, you know, types of poetic foot, you know, how to pronounce the word Ceylon because my wife tends to pronounce it Ceylon, but she also pronounces tongue as tong, which I guess again is an English pronunciation, but probably, I don't know, Americans and people in other countries might not know about. Uh, th thank you, Helen, for that, for that comment on the sonnet. Um, I was a bit worried um, about writing a whole book of sonnets. I read this review of Seamus Heaney um, where the reviewer had said he's become too dependent on the sonnet. And I don't think that's true of Seamus Heaney, who wrote this amazing sonnets, but I was quite wary of becoming that person who was too dependent on the sonnet myself. And so now I'm very determined to sort of move beyond sonnets, but you're still gonna have to listen to uh, three more of them. Okay, so. <laughs> And so this is about traveling in the country, in the UK. So I guess in the UK, we have this kind of ongoing debate about nature writing and about the National Trust and whether people of color are not really represented in British nature writing and are not really represented amongst the demographic who would go to say a National Trust property, you know, an old manor house and enjoy nature or go hiking in nature and stuff like that. And I know that I didn't really grow up with that idea that you go for hikes and, you know, the English countryside is yours. It never really felt like mine, um, but my wife has helped me feel like, you know, maybe it, it is. Although, of course, now we live in the US. So anyway, I'll, I'll read this poem, Peak District. Um, there's a word here, bold, which means the trunk of a tree. And biddy is like a word for a kind of older woman in Sri Lanka. It's quite an affectionate word, at least I hope it comes across that way. Uh, Peak District. The lambs wore fuchsia digits. Wisps of torn cloud hung from beech roots and barbed wire. Close bowls fused. Why were we here? To flee our inboxes. To peer half cut down a blue road, hunting pockets of signal. After killing the bottle, it became possible to say and do wonderful things to each other. A quip from our guide concerning the light and dark peaks. A biddy glowered in her one street village from her stone bench. You drove fast and sure round the lake clouds turned mauve before they swung apart and we faced the glitter like cameras flashing in a stadium crowd. Mm. Um, so yeah, sort of mixed experience of nature and um, yeah, you know, I, I mentioned Seamus Heaney. I love Seamus Heaney's poems, but you know, I find it very, very hard to write poems about nature. I mean, a um, great novelist, Vladimir Nabokov, you know, the student came to him and said, I want to be a writer. And he pointed out the window and said, that tree, what kind of tree is that? And the student said, I don't know. And he said, you'll never be a writer. <laughs> or something like that. He used to hate that anecdote because I'm terrible with the names of trees, flowers, birds. Um, but one of the things I came to understand writing this book is that that might have something to do with being a particular kind of immigrant. You're, you're not actually aware of the names of the things that surround you in, in the country that you moved to. Okay, so this um, third poem is the Alfreda de Silva poem, you know, the poem by the other Sri Lankan poet. And Indrin was just saying that he knows quite a bit about this poet. Um, and I really didn't. I'd never read any of her poems before I started working on this anthology. Um, and as you can see from this bio note, that, you know, she wasn't unsuccessful in her lifetime. You know, she did all kinds of things. But her two collections of poetry for adults, Out of the Darker Sun and The Unpredictable Blood, are out of print. It's very hard to get a hold of them. Um, so I wanted to share with you one to share with you one of her poems, a poem which she seems to have rewritten throughout her life, because I found four different versions of this poem, and, and I think this is my favorite version of the poem, um, and it's called Grass Fields in Sunlight. Uh, uh, Vidyan, can I just ask you quickly? Did did he did Rachel Lillian 
what's that? Yeah, so the, the name on the box is always Alfreda de Silva, but she oh, also wow. went by these other names. I think Rachel in particular was, was an important name to her because it was her grandmother's name. And she wrote a prose memoir called My Grandmother's uh, ha Pagoda House, about her grandmother's house. Um, so that's where I've got some of this information from. But, um, and, it, and, and she wrote in English, not Sinhalese. In English, right. She did, she uh, wrote in English, yeah. And, and she has a, a great story in um, that memoir about being part of this Sinhalese Catholic community and of being a child asked to go to Sinhala lessons and of the children all chanting, we, we, don't, we don't want to speak Sinhala, we are English. So it's a kind of vanished culture, of, you know, this sort of anglicized elite. You know, very different from the Tamil community I come from, but, um, mm -hmm. but she's a very interesting poet, I think. Okay, um, so grass fields in sunlight. Now, at one end of them, the squatters' shacks hurt the eyes with their tin white roofs and the stench of rotting dirt piled on the tree roots disturbs the old images. Once these were fields turned into seas or mountains by childhood, and the wind's cries were horses' hooves, and the whining grass, a tale one listened to in the moth-brushed night. I remember the sun over these fields, like a fisherman netting in green water, shocking everything with its scathing radiance on a day that fell in the reeds and was irretrievable. So it's just, you know, it's just such a beautiful poem and with a lot in it. I mean, I think the middle stanza is about being a child and being very frightened of one's surroundings and kind of reimagining them to try and be able to go to sleep. You know, I think the wind's cries are really the child's cries. I think the whining grass is really a whining child and the, the child gets a bedtime story, you know, the tale one listened to in the mothbush night always telling themselves the story. Um, it, you know, I, I gave a presentation on, on, on this poem, the versions of it recently at the University of Virginia, and I had some really interesting thoughts from all sorts of people about poems it may allude to. Like I always thought of it as a very Wordsworthian poem. And Wordsworth is a big part of um, colonial poetry education in Sri Lanka. You know, my mum, who might be watching now, actually, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, was asked at Jaffna Ladies College to memorize I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, even though she'd no idea what a daffodil was. So, you know, it's a Sri Lankan version of the Edward Kamal Braithwaite, children <laughs> in the Caribbean, you know, being asked to write about snow, they never seen snow. So they end up writing poems about snow falling on cane fields. So, yeah, I think that there's words worth here, but um, a professor there suggested Yeats as well, and Yeats's poem about the fishermen, and, and I've learned since then that um, De Silva really loved Yeats. So that's a possibility. Um, so I think it's a poem that's really in dialogue with a lot of um, Anglo-American, or West, I should say Euro-American poetry. It's, it's a very interesting poem. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, Helen, about the scathing radiance. Yeah, I love that line. It's interesting. <laughs> she kind of takes a while. If you look at the draft, and I can share this paper with you, she takes a while to discover that assonantal connection. And then she kind of does another version where she sabotages it, really spoils it. And then she comes back to this version, which is always interesting when a poet kind of undoes revisions that they've made. Mm. So it goes back to her version. Okay, so this poem is called I've Noticed Something. Um, I'm not very good at coming up with titles for poems. So when I learned from, I mean, a number of poets do it, but I think I probably got it from Ted Hughes, that you can run the first line, the title can be the start of the poem, and you can run the title into the first line. This was, uh, you know, a great floodgate opening for me. <laughs> so you probably have too many poems which function in this way. So I've noticed something is part of the first line. And um, so as I said, this was a book of sonnets for my wife. And um, so obviously I'm a, a brown man, you know, a Sri Lankan, Tamil, British, American, whatever man. And she is a, a white woman um, with actually Greek ancestry. And I wanted to explore in the book some of the, the overlaps that you experience, you know, different kinds of 
um, negative experience. You know, racism and sexism can be very different things, but they can also be overlapping things. Right? So, so it's a kind of poem about the things we share in the experiences we've had often with other people and the things that maybe we don't share, but we can help each other understand. So, so I've noticed something. I've noticed something. We both peter out when speaking, saying, but I don't know, or something. Why? In your family, talk is for the jousting men. You write, you listen, you read. You step back from an opinion always as if saying, why bother? I could be wrong. Which I don't think of as being shy. You simply haven't the need to set the world to rights of a man. And what of my own habit of cutting myself off? Less out of fear I'm talking crap than just in case I won't be understood. I was the special son, bigged up, hot housed, second generation, precocious, unique, and therefore alone. But what we've both learned is how not to threaten, how not to seem to know more than our place. Really? So I was watching, thank you. Fantastic, uh, fantastic. I was watching The Truman Show with my wife, Jenny, Jenny Holden, who writes, she's a fiction writer. And I've always really loved The Truman Show. I don't know how many people have seen it, but you know, he discovers that it's, his life is a TV poem about his life. And she said, this is such a man film because only a man could simultaneously love and hate the idea that the whole world revolved around him. <laughs> that's, all, that's probably true. That's true. That is probably why that poem has had is that huge effect for me. And, and, and I think there's a considerable balance for us. We might now call it male privilege in it. The only thing I would say is that thinking the world revolves around you is actually quite a desolate place to be because um, it means you're never really happy. You know, I think you become happy when you think about other people, you know, you get away from that self-focus. Um, so with that in mind, this last sonnet is actually a translation. It's a translation I wrote with my, my dad's help and he again might be watching, <laughs> makes this slightly embarrassing. It's the nature of these Zoom readings. And we live in the US now, my parents still live in Leeds in the UK. Um, so this is a Tamil word for one's paternal uh, grandmother. I think that's right. And, and so this is a poem that was written by my father's mother. And her name was uh, Kamala Bhushani Thiranava Karasi. And she did all sorts of things in her life. You know, she was a headmistress in a school. Um, you know, she, she did a lot of work with uh, supposedly fallen women, which actually means women who, you know, fallen foul of this incredibly sexist cultural ways of doing things. Um, but we found out that she also wrote poems and she has this, this notebook poem she wrote. And my dad uh, translated them from Tamil into English and I worked with him to turn them into English poems. And this one seemed to work as a kind of sonnet. Um, so uh, Sri Lanka is in a really desperate state at the moment. Um, you know, it's a real crisis. It has turned from an economic crisis into you know, things being set on fire and people being killed in the streets and all sorts of things. Um, and I don't think this is the best place to really talk about that, but I'd encourage people to try and read about it in the news because it's very much been obscured by, you know, other global events. Um, but just with that in mind, I, I wanted to read a poem written by my grandmother who actually lived and died in Sri Lanka. Um, and also a poem with some positivity and hope to it <laughs> because maybe my own poems don't have so much of that in them so but, but hers do so <clears throat> party dawn darkness is done with gone from the earth the sun's red face makes the shapeless once again distinct foliage smothering the path the kanaka flowers like painted cups amid a tiny forest as one corolla withers, there bursts the next from its green spike. The achieved bloom has learned to seduce. The closed bud just below goes untouched even by the shadow of an insect. Just a leaf, the bee says. Today's flame shrivels, but why make a fuss? The flower of tomorrow is yet to open.
Mm. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Reminds oh, me of the end, it reminds me of the, the chess, chess love Milosh's poem, um, where I'm not quoting it, but he's talking about the world being completely awry, full of war and so on and so forth. But he says, why don't you just pause and just look at the swallow on the tree yeah. outside the window? Yeah. I, I have, you know, I, I really like his poem. I really admire him as a poet. And I um, was asked to review um, a, bio, a biography of him, and I couldn't quite get the, the approach right. And in the end, the magazine, the commissioner didn't publish the, the review because on the one hand, I find some of his later poems a bit, you know, sentimental. But on the other hand, I really profoundly, as a Sri Lankan Tamil, feel a lot of the same thing he does, of the idea that there's almost a duty to be happy here on behalf of those who didn't make it. So you kind of, you worry your happiness is illegitimate because of all that suffering. But at the same time, you feel like you're supposed to be happy. And maybe a lot of immigrant children get that. It's like you're meant to do so well and take advantage of all these opportunities that you know your ancestors didn't have. But also, you're meant to be really happy while you're doing it because they didn't get to be happy. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there's something about Milwash that does really, really appeal to me there. And I think that's very perceptive because that's a poet I've read and reread, and it probably is just in my mind. Yeah. I mean, his early and middle, his early and middle period particularly was strong. But you're right; at the end, sort of got sentimental. But partly, it, the sentimentality, and I'll come back to your poem. But it's important to discuss this because we, you know, your some of your poems are about hope and consolation and about positivity as well. But part of the mellowness, perhaps, is just the fact that all that's been done, and we need to just smile a bit more and have have. And then it's difficult in poetry to get that and not be sentimental, maybe perhaps. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And just quickly, the questions in the chat to Deedle. Um, yes, so my grandmother wrote wrote it. It wasn't originally a sonnet, no. I mean, it was probably in a form which my dad could speak better about than I could, but in Tamil, it wasn't a sonnet. But when I started to translate it, it, it seemed to fit the sonnet form. Um, and the, my grandmother's poems, I, I don't know if we can fit them in the anthology because we have so many published poets to include, but I did translate more of them and they were published in uh, the British Poetry Magazine, I guess international magazine, Modern Poetry and Translation. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's interested, I can, I can share more of those. those yeah. poems. I, I want to ask but, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just one thing before I forget. Uh, you're talking about you know, being an immigrant child and so on. And that's of course obvious. And, you know, the visual context is difficult to, um, you know, uh, as you said, I'm a brown man. I mean, yeah. Sure. Yeah. now the thing is, it's interesting because a lot of your backstory and uh, narratives of Im uh, immigration or being an immigrant is beautifully, um, it comes across in a very subdued manner. I mean, your tonality is extremely English. Mm. The tone of the poems. Yeah. Even though you're talking about a lot of, uh, you know, your historic uh, background, the tone is very English. And it is a difficult act to balance in a sense, because you don't want to exoticize Sri Lanka and South Asia and colonialism. And at the same time, you don't want to be completely English because, you know, it is not English in a sense. Yeah. So I'd like you to talk about this interface, how you balance and calibrate uh, this. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm very, I mean, to try and bring that together with your previous question, which I didn't get to answer about, you know, a bit of happiness. I mean, I'm very influenced by a lot of canonical English poets, and one of them would be Keats. And of course, one of the accusations made of Keats is that, you know, all this terrible stuff is happening in England at the time, you know, um, the Peterloo massacre and so on. And he's just written this beautiful poem about autumn fields. And we had all these, you know, scholarships saying, this is irresponsible in some way that you can't do this. Um, but uh, so that idea that you, you're not allowed to be happy actually runs very deep in, I think, poetry, culture, literary criticism. And, um, and I always felt that, 
maybe it was as a, Sri, a kind of Sri Lankan, a Sri Lankan Tamil, I felt that was very unfair to say of Keats because a lot of us feel that, you know, um, it's because there's so much suffering, partly in our own lives and partly in other people's lives, that you have to really cherish moments of happiness. It's not that the moments of happiness are denying that other stuff is happening. So I've always felt very distanced from the way that sort of the white professors around me were thinking about canonical works of literature because of that. Um, so um, anyway, so um, yes, yeah, so what you're saying about very English. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Uh, I think that's very true. Uh, so the title is actually from Philip Larkin. And Philip Larkin um, was a great poet and an asshole. <laughs> I probably would never want to meet because, you know, just a, a real, definitely a, a racist, although very interesting kind of racist who also greatly admired jazz and wrote all these reviews for the Telegraph about how wonderful Billie Holiday was and so on. So a very conflicted kind of racist, I think. Um, but I wanted that title be because um, in a way, I know that even if I might not agree with a lot of Larkin's views, that there is a kind of Englishness and a kind of English poetry that's really shaped me. And I'm not really interested in pretending that that is inauthentic and the actual authenticity is somewhere in Sri Lanka. And one day I'm going to go there and I'm going to dig it up and it's going to be, you know, <laughs> the British comedian Lenny Henry, you know, Black British. <laughs> he used to have this wonderful bit about you know, the idea that he will journey back to Africa and, you know, sniff the soil and have a moment and stuff like that. Mm. But it's like, do we ever actually get to that place of authenticity or do we have to actually discover that where we are? I mean, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I would say that to me, I felt that one has to discover where one is. And we all have, no matter what the color of our skin is or our subject position, we all have very impure histories shaped by huge global events of all sorts of wars and, and things like that patterns of migration. Um, so to get back, so there isn't really a pure, unsullied position to get back to, you know, we have to sort of begin from where we've ended up, I think. Vidyan, I just want to say thank you for your poems, uh, and also ask you to talk a little bit about Ceylon. I mean, you know, I wrote a, a book once called Ceylon R.I.P. And then, yeah. and then I think about Ceylon uh, during the 1983 quote unquote riots as they're called in Ceylon, which is really a program organized to do by the state against the Tamil minority. And, um, and then I think, uh, so, and then I think about Ceylon when I was born in the island of Ceylon and then how it changed and somehow the change of the name became, became something else, something yeah. alien to me, something, uh, this, uh, disquiet came into the air with the name change and, um, all of this, I mean, these are just my reflections that sure. I think about reading your poem, but your poem is this brilliant uh, thing about the tastelessness of Tetley. I mean, yes. That, that, <laughs> no, no, I'm just and, thinking, you know, I guess what you're saying, Andrew, like I'm thinking of how you write in that book, well, one line is you're, there's, there's not much art in the bombing of Jaffa, or, or right. maybe I'm more of that line. Okay. And in that line, on the one hand, you've got, you know, there are these things we have to talk about. Right, which is like the bombing of Jaffa, but also how does the poet avoid becoming a journalist? I mean, this is a complicated in Sri Lanka because arguably we need more journalism, you know, unbiased journalism about Sri Lanka, but the poet isn't a journalist. So, I mean, what I understood you saying in that line is also there's not much art in it in the sense that the government was so indiscriminate and they dropped shells on civilians, right? So there's no art, it's artless, right. but also in the sense that there's nothing, to, there's no poem to be written about it. There's no art in it for you to take out of it. And I think that that kind of, in microcosm, sums up sort of my feeling of, there's a particular amount of subject matter and it's both a burden and a gift. It's like, you feel like you need to write about it, but how do you write about it as a poet without just writing? Yeah very bad and maybe even appropriative uh, um, poems. Um, and, and reading the poems for the anthology, I have read some poems which I think um, are not going in the anthology because I think the poets who wrote them were sort of appropriative in a way. So, so it's very hard to, to find that, that balance, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, no, I am very uh, sensitive to that. I mean, yeah, I know, I know. Mm. So, so it's sort of, that's why, I mean, that's why I think that I really love that poem of yours. So I'm struggling with that a lot. And um, I, I, I should end so we can move on to the next poem. But the last thing I'll say is that um, I've waited a long time to try and write my Sri Lanka book. 
And I think the third collection will be that book because I think that I'm kind of ready to do it now. I found a way of doing it. Really excited, looking forward to that mm -hmm. and, and to we reading and reading the poems you already produced. It'll be interesting actually to compare this, uh, you know, Indran's and yours and what Michael Undachi has done before. Yeah. You know, his, his revisiting of Sri Lanka, though he's, you know, very un Sri Lankan <laughs> otherwise, both in his writing and his views and so on. But then, but anyway, that's, you know, we can go on and on. I yeah, mean, yeah, that'd be you, lovely to you, you guys, are you just guys, Sarah and Ellen and you are just such rich poets that we can go on and on. And that's the beauty of this program, I think. It's intimate, it's, um, it's uh, hopefully deep <laughs> because we are all poets discussing. Uh, poetry and as Don will tell you that uh, this goes out to at least, you know, every program has at least 10,000 hits and uh, Don especially sees an uh, angel in residence, a poet in residence, an angel in residence. He has hooked this program to about what, 50, 60 MFA programs, which use these as masterclasses mod modules. So, which is the reason which, why we also talk. Uh, uh, but thank you, uh, Vidin. It was brilliant. Thank um, you. Thank yes. you. And thank you, oh, Michael, from, for your comment just now in the chat uh, as well, and all the others. Yeah, the poetry. So one poetry. brilliant poet to another brilliant poet to another brilliant poet. So now it's turn uh, of Helen Ivory, who's a, both a poet and a brilliant artist. And uh, I'm really envious because it's one of those rare husband and wife team which just are outstanding. And they actually get along. And they're funny and witty and intelligent and down to earth. Um, so I've got the, I've got the uh, bio on the side, but I'll read it out. Um, Helen Ivory is a UK poet and visual artist. Her fifth Blood Axe collection, The Anatomical Venus, came out in nine, uh, 2019. And you can see the cover. Uh, she often does, or maybe always does the covers herself, I think, yeah. Uh, she edits the webzine, an excellent webzine you should visit called Ink, Sweat and Tears, and teaches creative writing online for University of East Anglia and uh, uh, writing uh, NCW. Uh, a book of mixed media poems, Hear What the Moon Told Me, was published by KFS, and a chapbook, map of the abandoned city by Sir Vision. She, uh, she has work translated into Polish, Ukrainian, and Spanish as part of the Vesopolis project, which is yet another amazing project which you should look at. European poets are very, very lucky that, you know, this project, formal project is there and the translations, they intertranslate inter each other's work and produce these books. Her new and selected will appear from Mad Hat in the US in 2022, which is a brilliant book. I've read a lot of poems from there actually, so I have a little bit of a preview. Uh, and uh, she's currently working on her next collection, How to Construct a Witch. I'm not surprised with the title. <laughs> 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 Helen, Helen, a very, very warm welcome. Bless you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yeah, it's just it's so lovely. It's a lovely environment. And then I heard how many actual people might be eventually <laughs> tuning in and this might be a masterclass and suddenly I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> I was slightly, yeah, just the idea of the tea as well, the kind of, um, that you were talking about, um, the kind of dust tea as well, that struck a chord. Because um, Sudeep was supposed to have some nice Earl Grey tea, and he always got the dust tea when he was here. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop talking. You, made, just... you made, up, made it up with wine, though. It's good. <laughs> we made it up with wine, very much so. We de definitely do, and hopefully would again. Anyway, I shall, I'll read you some poems now. Um, yeah, so I'll, be, I'll read some poems from the Anatomical Venus. Uh, which came out just before the pandemic. Um, so it's been quite difficult kind of getting it out into the world as one might imagine. And if you don't know what an anatomical Venus is, it's one of these things. You might have seen them. There were, um, there were ways, there were kind of wax sculpture things. There's lots of these different things. That, um, we've got in um, a kind of Sleeping Beauty version. Uh, also, oh, what's that? That's me. I'll mute myself. Oh. What was that? 
That was a CIA interference from America. Well, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's because I'm showing these kind of weird, dodgy images of. Uh, can you just put it up close, close to yeah, the screen? Yeah, sure. Can, I mean, they're that. kind of macabre. Um, kind of, there's, there's a whole sex and death thing going on. There were sculptures that um, the doctors um, would learn from. So they're, they're set up as, um, yeah, sculptures, and they're, they're all women that could be pulled apart, um, essentially. And they would. Um, used human hair in them and they, they they were made them of wax because they looked because wax looks like kind of deathly human skin and probably feels like it as well um so that's that so that's when I, I got my my metaphor to, to hang all, all of these poems from and the poems are about women and otherness so how women have been seen as hysterics and which is the idea of the wandering womb um, so if anything, um, in olden days medicine, if, if anything went wrong with the womb, with the woman, it's because her womb was wandering about body. So the idea was to tempt it back, <laughs> which they did, but, you know, with nice, nice odours and, you know, it goes back and then she's normal again. So th this, po this poem brings a little bit of the wandering womb, it, womb in. And I, I did quite a bit of research for this book. And the title comes from the Bible, from, from Exodus. Thou shalt not suffer a sorceress to live. Oh, and I must tell you as well, um, that a lot of the text comes um, from the Essex witch trials. So it's, it's based on things that people said about particular women. They were usually women. There were sometimes men um, that were tried as witches, but usually women. And so the, it, the text, and I, I poemed them up a bit, shall we say. Um, so thou shalt not suffer a sorceress to live. For her neighbor's sickness was more than merely unnatural. For he sang perfectly without moving his lips. For she is intemperate in her desires and pilfers apples from the orchard. For she hitches her skirts to clamber the fence. For her womb is a wandering beast. For she is husbandless and at candle time brazenly trades with the devil. For she spoke razors to her brother and who has looked upon her witch's pap and the odious suckling imp. For the corn is foul teeth, for the horse is bedlam in its stable, for the black cow and the white cow are dead. <laughs> <laughs> so there are all the reasons why she is a witch you know if anything goes wrong in the village you know you have a scapegoat and it's usually some um some very poor person in articulate um yeah anyway so the um the the main manual for the witch finders was a um a something called the malleus maleficarum in 1486 um, by the woman Springer. And, and it's one of the most misogynist texts you would ever hope to read. <laughs> and if you do read it, you'll, you'll probably get angry as I did. And um, yeah, I can see that there's anger that, that goes through these. Um, and the, the, so the, um, the little quote from the Malleus goes, to conclude, all witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which is in women insatiable. So, this is the hanged woman addresses the Reverend Heinrich Kramer. Do you cower in your crib at night against encroaching evil tongues? I picture you skittish inside your nightgown as swollen tempest swoop upon your roof and rattle the door you bolted thrice against the dark invisible. You said my womb knew such hunger that I might devour a man entire. Pray tell me in your clearest chapel voice what tales they told you at the breast. A pretty devil's pack would render your creeping flesh delicious. A sour wind stirs papers on your desk. You say women have weak memories, then you shall be perplexed that despite my ruined body in the noose, I recall each gnawing passage of your book. When the sun awakens, they will cut me down. Oh, so, take care <laughs> it's a dangerous world out there um so an another i don't know i i got involved in you know when you research you get involved in internet searches and things and i i th there was this magazine article um that was written recently um called 10 signs you might be a slut and you had to kind of tick these things you know off yeah sure yeah yeah I'll do that I'll do that so because of my research and where where my language had been <laughs> um, so I took the language back a, a few hundred years 
So this is six signs you might be a slattern. Are you a little draggle tail? Do your skirts be devil leavings from the gutter? When you take a turn around the park, do bitches bevy close and claim you kin? Are you wanton in your daily intercourse, your ankles grimed, your lip stained cochineal? And how's your baking lately? Is your dough a coffer for sluts pennies? <laughs> do you hear ill clamouring in your breast? Is there a midden where your heart should sit? When a caller raps, does your front door acquiesce directly? The catch already sprung. Mm. I forgot to mention that there's um, there's something that if you if you um, make a loaf of bread and it goes bad like there are kind of um, hard bits in it I don't know you, you're a bad baker and those things in it are called slut pennies so there's an actual thing oh. you don't want it in your bread whatever it is um, so this one um, is um, Baba Yaga no longer reads the news and it's about, it speaks to, um, I, I think that it's happening a little more now, but um, the older women are kind of ushered out of the public eye. So, you know, once she gets old and witchy, um, she gets taken off the news. And often you see um, people paired up. I mean, on, on our TV, um, kind of breakfast TV there's, always a TV, there's a kind of a younger woman and an older man. So the, you know, the older women are kind of kicked out. So this is Baba Yaga, who's a, who's a famous witch, who um, I think she lives in a house with chicken legs, the house. So anyway, this is that, the, is the unsavourableness of the older woman. So Baba Yaga no longer reads the news. Since decommissioned, she's a dugout in the woods. Word is she's quit electrolysis, so her stubbled legs resemble chicken flesh, and likewise her eyebrows foster a dire and savage air. She creeps through the spinny, zealous as ground frost, scouring for morsels to tender her pot. She is a fallow vessel who deigned to grey, a babble word. Now rumour of an intern eaten whole, young reporters always hustling for a story. The talking dolls, the lantern skulls and oven, chocked with teeth, how, and how she is protected by the devil's spitting geese. So mm. it's the whole idea of kind of spreading rumours about someone. Oh, she does this, she does that, oh, does she? You know, <laughs> she must be a witch. <laughs> um, this so this poem um, is um, so the idea of the anatomical Venus. Let's go back to that Im image there. Um, quite often in crime dramas, um, I think they do it a little less now, but they um, they often really fixate on um, a dead woman on a mortuary slab. And um, and I thought, oh, there's the anatomical Venus. She's still with us. <laughs> and the, often the light is be beautiful, although eerie, obviously because she's dead on that. Um, so there's a kind of bluish beauty to her. Um, and I I kind of, I yeah. So this is that, and she is Venus also. So the the, the Venus, i.e., the goddess, gets her close up. The blue light you find there is prime for inquiry, while the stilled hush of blood grants, it grants time enough for the checklist in your head. You are familiar with this scene, the chill glamour of the mortuary. The dead work girl gives up her secrets of the last hand to touch her, the skin, the semen, reticular lesions. The camera feigns discretion, but is restless to show its intimacy with Rossetti's prosopping, just can't help itself from eulogising hair, the blush of pomegranate. The goddess will see you now. Thank you for waiting. She has planted some seeds in your room. She will rise up for the harvest. She will tap on your window at dawn. Blush of, the, <laughs> blush of the pomegranate, wonderful. Oh yeah, the pomegranate, yeah. Love it, you hate it. <laughs> um, so I, I've That's got two poems good. left. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, this one, let's, let's see who this narrator is. Um, have I got two poems left? I don't know, how many have I sent you? Or maybe a few, let's, should we just do two more? I don't know how, I didn't check how long I've been reading. What do you think? When did I start? I'm terrible at this. 
do three. <laughs> do three. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so I have three pounds left. So this one. Um, so let's imagine the the narrator is a, a. I don't know. She's a really cross woman whose um whose husband is is gone off with a with a younger woman and she's there doing a housework and she's a bit medusery. She's gone a bit that way. <laughs> so <laughs> stripped. The kitchen is a little messy for burlesque, but let's begin. Shift the chickens, stake that bleating goat, slide the jug of wine to one side. You're home a little early from her bed. Your supper is still bubbling on the stove. My hair is restless as a nest of snakes. Your shirts are pegged out on the whirly gig. Behold the dance I practice every night. The dining table is a makeshift stage. I serve myself up as a ransacked eel. That girl will learn these labours soon enough. Don't you know her eyes are painted on? The glamour of the candles will describe solely what you think is there. The same goes for that cocker doodle doo of hair. For the finale, finale, I shuck off my nylon veil. My nakedness is lately venom to your sight. Here's your ring back, those asinine mixtapes. I'll tear out a rib, return it on an oval plate. <laughs> um, thank you. I tell you what, I will end on this one because that, that after that, I've got a few newer poems and it kind of would make more sense if I end on this one. Um, um, so this one, um, there's a man called um, John Dunton, who in eight, um, 1684 um, wrote the Ladies' Dictionary, in which he, he put things that he thought ladies should know, um, kind of domestic things, um, how, how men like ladies' hair, which he was blonde, apparently. He, there were pages and pages of how to keep your hair blonde and, and stuff. Um, so, and there was a... Um, uh, there was an entry um, for anger in ladies, etc. So anger in ladies, etc. makes a beauteous face deformed and contemptible and separates roses and lilies by quite removing one or the other out of the lady's cheeks. <laughs> so, the ladies are ripping roses and lilies to rags. They are broadcasting them like bruised confetti, trampling them into the carpet so the parlour reeks of death, or the mask of death, death spangled up, death sullying the carpet. The ladies are rendering themselves contemptible. They are pollen stained and beastly. They are pouring the floorboards. Now they will lecture you on how to wear your hair, Mr. Dunton, how to cover your shame. They are sharpening their bread knives. Mm. Thank you, it's a good place to end. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, it's a killer strike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, I, I can talk a lot about the poetry, but you must uh, talk a little bit about your parallel art, which is, you know, your, your, your work as an artist. And, and I see, having seen some of it, and how you construct it, because you put it on Facebook, and we see the progression of how these fluffy things become things. Um, how closely is poetry and your art related? I mean, they, they are very closely related, but how do you, let's say, how do you separate them? Okay, well, the fluffy things to which Sudit refers, <laughs> they, they are, so I make needle felted creatures. And um, so it's like sculpture, but made from wool. And I, I made lots of um, recently, start, starting the witch theme, I've been making quite a lot of poppets. So little kind of odd dolls. And they, they, so all this coincided with the lockdown. I got heavily involved in making um, poppets and foxes. So these, 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 um, these poppets, I, I would go and get them, but my studio's all the way down there. Um, so the, um, so yeah, uh, this this fox with this poppet kind of riding in some kind of fantasy thing. So that helped people and myself through lockdown. Um, so prior to that, I was making quite a lot of um, collage and assemblage, and um, so cutting up um, words um, from old, really old books. Sorry about this, guys. I cut, do cut up books, but I only cut up really damaged books. You know, I wouldn't. You know, and it's something that's already been sullied. 
um, you know, he heavily foxed, <laughs> not in a good way. Um, and just, yeah, juxtaposing different words and images and seeing what happens, um, you know, making new narratives. I started, to, I, mean, I went to art school originally, but I started getting into visual work again, just by doing a, um, a writing workshop with people you know, the whole collage thing, you know, you cut up things, you make things from existing things, you know, because words are ready made, aren't they? So, you know, you've already got that, you know, you, you've got the word, I don't know, sun, and um, the, you've got the whole sun. So, you know, you can put the word sun on a, a, a big blue piece of paper and suddenly, you know, the sun radiating. And so I just like the idea of how one thing, you know, um, bounces off each other and yeah. And yeah, well, your, your poems, of course, on the page are extremely uh, precise and you know extremely well calibrated, but they also have a wonderful performative quality. And of course, you read well. All the poets read very well. But I mean, in your case and in Martin's case, your husband, you both also perform very well. Um, do you think it's difficult to manage the registers of the two kinds of um, readership? Because when you're reading in the quiet, um, the, the volume and the treble and the bass comes across differently as opposed to when you're actually reading it out. Where, yeah. how, do you, how, do you, how do you kind of take into account those, those aspects? I don't know. I mean, when I'm writing, I can't almost, I'm reading aloud in my head. So I know what the music and I know how I want something to sound even before I say it out loud. And then once I've, once I've written a first draft of something, I'll read it out to see what it sounds like. Um, so I think that, you know, what something sounds like and, and what it looks like is part of the same thing. You know, it's a whole, the whole mm. thing, you know, it's really, really important to me. Also the way that it looks as well, the way it looks on the page, you know, it, it's, a, it's a whole, it's a whole piece um yeah if that answers your question yeah and um, when I first started doing readings I mean it's absolutely terrifying when you start first start reading in front of people even you know just with a small workshop group reading so, and also people interpreting things you know once you leave your mouth <laughs> it's out into their heads you know and what they will what they will see in it and that was pretty scary but I don't know you, you've just got to get over that haven't you <laughs> or you just sit in a quiet room um, so, which is fine, you know, that's, that's cool for some people. Helen, let me just say thank you, gorgeous poems. This last poem, for example, I mean, where you talk about, you know, I think I mentioned earlier about the blush of pomegranate. And it makes me think, you know, the goddess will see you now, thank you for waiting. I mean, there's a sense of humor. <laughs> She's planted some seeds in your room. She'll rise up for the harvest, she will tap what you window at dawn. And, I, I, I wonder, um, you bring up this uncomfortable, unpleasant uh, uh, sort of <laughs> roots of, of, the, of the division, uh, the divorce between you know, man and woman, and yet you bring it in this language that is so rich and, and welcoming and, and, and so charming. But there's a bite, you know, there's, the, there's a knife uh, hidden in the... Uh, yeah, the there's always a knife. Yeah, yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. But I, I mean, I'm wondering how to teach the poem and where to the. I mean, I, well, I, 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 look, I'm looking forward to, to to doing that in the future because I, I see my future, some of my future as, as sharing poems I love and, and you know to students and class. But I mean, look, it's it's a rich uh, work. Well done, thank you, and I'm so glad that. Uh, that yes. we introduced your work this way. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So the anatomical Venuses makes me think of Frida Kahlo. Uh, Has she been important to you at all? Um, important, I suppose. I mean, okay, I have a bag with Frida Kahlo on it. Ha you know, it's my shopping bag. <laughs> I think... Um, I don't know, that's a bit flippant, isn't it? I think um, female artists like Frida Kahlo and like Leonora Carrington are just, um, their imagination, you know, the things that they put in their poems. Also Frida, and also um, she puts animals in her poems as well, don't she? I have quite a lot of animals in mine. And just the colours of her work, 
um, and how it is about the body. Um, I suppose it, it, is, it is important. Her work is important to me. I think um, I'm inspired, I don't almost as much by visual artists as I am by poets. And I, you know, because I, I, her work is pretty poetic, isn't it? And I know that I don't know if you if you're aware of um, Pascal um, Petit has done. Yeah, um, yeah she did a, a chat book um, on the on, I can't even remember what it's called. The Wounded Deer, I think quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, based on on Frida's um, paintings. Um, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, leading from that uh, question, Sarah, I have a question. Sarah, for you, uh, when I've read your work, and I've read a couple of your earlier books as well, um, there's a very kind of acute, um, it's difficult to phrase this because I don't want to gender the word, I don't want to say it's male or female, but there's a very, very acute feminine intelligence that runs through your poetry like it does, let's say, Anne Carson. Um, you really have to spend a lot of time if you want to do justice um, to understanding the nuances of your poem. Where does Anne Carson fit in? Or maybe she doesn't at all, you know, poetic, you know. Sorry, is that a question for that, Sarah? That's for Sarah, that's for yeah. Sarah, yeah. Oh, um, <clears throat> we're all enormous admirers of Anne Carson, aren't we? <laughs> She's a remarkably original, deep, a oh, fantastic thinker and person. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I wouldn't think of my work as being anything like hers at all or coming from the same place at all. Um, I think she draws her work from cl classical Classic. sources and I don't. Um, I draw mine from this here and now source, you know, ex except of course in the aspect of language itself because I'm, well, into languages. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I draw on my knowledge of languages. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I've been doing the New York Times spelling bee and I always get genius. I say to myself, oh, I'm a genius. <laughs> I can do the New York Times spelling bee. <laughs> I don't think you should let that out in public, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> The definition of genius by the New York Times. <laughs> well done, well done. Congratulations. Uh, that Vivian, I have a, yeah, that's that's good. No, no, no. It was just a query because you know I, I see that searing intelligence in both your poetry and hers. Very different, of course, but you know, you know, it's it's quite remarkable in a way. Vivian, I have a quick question because I'm fascinated with the title of your last book that's forthcoming. You have three of them, you know, it's quite something. Asian slash other prosody. Can you just tell us briefly about that? Because it sounds quite unique. unique. Uh, well, in the UK, you have this thing called, so you call opportunities form. So you, so you fill it out when you're asked to do something and you, you pick whichever box um, you're meant to for your race. Um, but the thing is, there usually isn't a Sri Lankan box. You know, there'll be a sort of Indian box, a Bangladeshi box, a Pakistani box, and then there'll be sort of Asian other. <laughs> so, so I thought I'd do that, but but also um, since moving to the US, I guess what I've realized is that the word Asian itself usually like, includes an erasure, doesn't it? Like in the UK, the people erased by it are, I guess, speaking broadly, people of East Asian, Asian heritage. And in the US, it's all the other way around, you know, like so it's sort of people of South Asian heritage you get erased. So, so I thought it would be a so, so I, I like that half of the title. I'm less sure about a life in poetry, which still feels a bit naff. But, um, <laughs> but, but we're actually, the Asian other bit will definitely be there. We're but actually, I'm working on the second half after the column. Uh, what's going to happen? And just just to mention that we're actually celebrating Asian American Heritage Month in the United States at the moment. And <laughs> myself a rather odd connection to Asian American. I remember. An anthology called Poem, uh, Boat Poems of Asian American. There were three South Asian poets included in that and caused a lot of grief for the editor at the time. Um, um, and, and this whole question of who has the right to belong to the category, you know, yeah. continues today to be a problem 
with the yeah. Asian American and Pacific Islander. Sorry, that's the other. Yes, that's really. right. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, it's been sort of shifting from being you know one acronym category, sort of B A M E, to now A A P R. <laughs> And it's quite difficult <laughs> to sort of keep track of which category one is now in. But I think it's sort of well, it's well intentioned, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it can kind of skimp on nuances. Like I teach, I'm teaching a course which is about, it was called South Asian poetry. And then I thought, and the reason, so, so I could talk about poetry that was actually written by poets who lived and continued to in South Asia. And um, now I'm going to include um, poets who are, you know, diasporic and have hybrid identities in other countries. But I'm finding it very hard to title this course because um, to, to make it clear in the title of the course what I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there are problems just in terms maybe of maybe South that. Asian heritage poets. Yeah, South Asian heritage poetry, something course, yeah. <laughs> Vigian's course. I, 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 I just, I just, I was. Uh, gladdened by your comment about Larkin, um, that you read like you're not worried about erasing Larkin because of his his racism or his uh, you know his sort of other. No, things, I, I guess I, I'm thing. not really like I, I recently wrote a radio essay about Larkin. He wrote a poem called Ambulances, which to me almost reads now as sort of praise for the NHS. So that's sort of how I read the poem. Um, I think no, I don't think we have to erase Larkin because of his views, but right, at the no, same I, time, I, I, but at the same time, I, I think that the need of some people to idealize him and pretend the views didn't exist also seems very odd to me. It's as yeah. if we just cannot have this poet who could be a sort of contaminated figure in any way. Like he has to either be a saint or a devil. You know, we can't really have someone right. who, could, who could do things like others. And um, yeah, the, the title of my collection is from a rare evocation of a sort of happiness in Larkin. I don't think he was a very happy person. He's a very unhappy person. I guess what I'm interested in a lot of the moment is poets who, and I guess most of them were, you know, they are, you know, dead white men, but they're often white men of a very particular class that can, as well. So we should remember that. And they kind of universalize from their own unhappiness. I like the idea that, you know, there could be a worldview inside their misery. So that's kind of <laughs> something about at the moment. Um, so, so yeah, Larkin does sort of fascinate me as a figure, and, and just such a good. Po I mean, if you love poetry, you, know, you read a Larkin poem; it's so technically brilliant. It, it's yeah. so, um, you, you know, you can just go on for days about just the sheer craft of it. Uh, if you don't want to think about the things he's actually saying, <laughs> sometimes I guess you know. Um, I had a, what I have found. This is a very long answer. Is that when I teach Larkin. Um, students often react against the universalizing sweep at the end of the poems because he likes to begin with I and end with we and I've often found students really really don't like that like I had one student say this is like drunk pub wisdom you know it's like something so like life is first boredom then fear whether or not we use it it goes and all these claims to which you want to say is it <laughs> you know speak for yourself and, and that is a mode that Larkin has access to which Maybe, maybe I'm only speaking for myself here, but as a contemporary poet, I, I really don't feel I have access to that sweep, that universalizing movement at the end of poem. So that does interest me. Too. Excuse me. So we have Excuse to... me. I, that's right. I, I have to jump out. And I, I just wanted... To, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have to jump out actually five minutes ago. And I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say one little thing in response to Vidyan, which um, is about happiness and suffering. And I just wanted to note that suffering does give rise to, to art and yeah. um, poetry. I mean, just, it's the unhappy person who makes the great art often. Mm. But, but I, my feeling about it is that um, if you're happy, enjoy your happiness. Don't bother sitting in a room alone weeping over your verses. <laughs> Was it Larkin who said happiness writes white? Writes white, yeah. Writes white, which, which could be yeah. read in a different yes. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's really hard to write about contentment, right? Because it feels yeah. like the status quo, like you're just. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to say goodbye yeah. and thank yes, you so much. Then, really, uh, it's been such a great yes. pleasure. It's thank you. Uh, 10, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah.
Bye, it's, Sarah. Uh, bye, bye. Uh, <laughs> bye. Goodbye. Thank See you, you again. I hope Thank elsewhere. You. Bye, bye. It's ten twenty nine uh, yeah. in Delhi, so I have, must. We should end. Uh, of course, it's you know we've gone over time, but it's been brilliant. I, sh I have to heat food for my partner, otherwise she'll s s kick me out of the house. Oh. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you so, so much, Vidyan, Sarah, Helen. It's been really, really brilliant. And uh, mm -hmm. as always, Indran and I just love it. You know, he chooses two poets and I choose two poets. And it's been going so well. Uh, and there's so much friendship and camar camaraderie. And Dawn is our angelic anchor who just keeps everything going. Dawn's a fantastic poet too, but yes. So let me just bid you good night from Delhi and see you all uh, next month, same time, uh, second Saturday of the month. Thank you so much. Wow. Have a good Thank evening. You. Lovely Thank to see you. Good day Thank from you. Washington. Thanks Take so care. much, Indra and Thank Sadeep. You, everyone. Bye, bye, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye. Nice seeing you guys. Likewise. Thanks, Don. Thanks.